I remember salivary glands back when I was studying anatomy as being a bit of a mainstay in histology. And I think it's because this is an exocrine gland. It's a good example of an exocrine gland because, well, it's one of those glands we're kind of aware of. We're aware of our saliva and you can palpate them. So it's ex excreting, it's quite a big gland excreting onto an external surface, not hidden away inside the body. And when we look at the histology, we can look at the secretory units and how they secrete onto ducts. We can see those ducts getting bigger and bigger and bigger. We can see how the secretory structures are arranged into lobules and how those large ducts then take everything out of the gland. And then once we've got an idea of that pattern and what a gland looks like, we can apply it to lots of other structures which are a bit more hidden away inside the body. So that's what we'll do. And this should be fairly straightforward. All right, what have we got? Well, um, there are three pairs of salivary glands. And by pairs, I mean there's a left one and a right one. We've got the parotid glands up here. We've got the submandibular glands. We've got the sublingual glands. Now, these salivary glands, uh, they're very important actually. They, uh, they, make, they have serous secretions and mucus secretions. And they do things like, they secrete enzymes like amylase, which starts off digestion. They secrete antimicrobial enzymes, and you've got one of the IgEs in there as well. So they've got immunological properties to protect this entryway into the body to kill pathogens. Um, there's the lubrication function to help you chew and swallow. There's the keeping your teeth from decaying function. And, and in here, you've got mucous membranes. Now the skin, it's waterproof, it's well protected, but in here, the mucous membranes are quite delicate. It needs to stay moist so they don't dry out, so the cells don't die, so saliva does that role as well. All right. <laughs> yeah, that looks like a gland. Um, okay, yeah. So this is the parotid gland. Now, of the three glands, they have serous cells, secreting a serous solution, which is full of proteins, enzymes, and what have you. And we have mucus secreting cells, which are secreting mucin, more of a, it's a good lubricating um, solution. Um, and some glands produce a bit of both. The parotid gland produces almost entirely serous secretions and well okay what can we see at low power so this is my four times um, objective lens and we can see that around the glandular tissue there's lots of connective tissue within that connective tissue we've got blood vessels and lymphatics and nerves and what have you um, and then that connective tissue is arranged into lobes or or lobules right by the connective tissue so that's one of the things, that's one of the good reasons for looking at a salivary gland, is you can see how the glandular tissue, the whole organ, is broken up into lobules. And then within that lobule, you can see more connective tissue. We can see some larger circles, so some larger ducts, and we can see lots of tiny, tiny units. So um, let's just jump down into that. Capsule, just so you can see the capsule there. So there's the connective tissue running between the lobules. So that's the organization here. And the thing we've got to try and imagine is um, here, I don't know if it looks like it yet, but we've actually got lots and lots and lots of cir cir circles of cells there. Not the, not the tubes, but all the other cells were arranged into circles. Um, this is another compound tubulo acinar exocrine gland. <laughs> compound means it has ducts which are branching. Tubular means that we've got tubular sections um, and secretory cells around in those tubular sections. And those tubular sections are ending as a, as a curved bit. So we have acinar cells. Does that make sense? Um, so actually, if I jump up to the higher power, so that's my 10 times objective, this is my 20 times objective, plus 10 times to my eyes, this is 200 times magnification for me. Um, it'll vary for you depending upon the size of your screen. Now look, we can see, we can see these, these structures run a little bit different, but it's, it's incredibly neat. 
Now, most of the glandular tissue then, we're not looking at the circles yet. Yeah, I think oh, I think those are those are some pretty convincing circles there in the middle. Um, we should jump up to a higher power. Um, let me try and tidy this up a little bit. So this is now 400 times magnification. Can you see how? So these are all the secretory cells here. Can you see how these secretory cells are making circles? And in the middle there, there is a tiny duct. Now these cells, they're all kind of jam-packed together, but they are kind of pyramidal cells. The nucleus is at the base, and all the secretory bits are in the cytoplasm closest to the apex. So that's because of the nuclear stuff's being made and it's moving through the cytoplasm and it's going to be excreted into, into the lumen, into the duct. But it's very difficult for us to see the ducts here. Um, so we're seeing lots of acini. Like I say, the, um, the parotid gland is made up of mostly serous cells. So these are, what we're seeing here is we're seeing, we're seeing uh, a proteinaceous serous secretion being made by these cells and stored in the cells and these are acini so they're forming those curves around a central lumen and it's these cells that are going to get infected by, by a virus in mumps so mumps is when the parotid gland gets infected these cells are the target of that virus with the inflammation and the swelling that capsule restricts how much the contents of the protein gland can swell, so that swelling pushes against the capsule and that's what causes the pain, and we see swelling here. So these serous acinar cells are the targets of the virus in mumps. Now, so if you imagine that all of those cells are secreting into little tiny, 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 tiny lumens, tiny, tiny ducts, they then drain into a slightly larger structure here. So this is your your yeah, intercalated duct. So these are intralobular ducts because these are ducts within the lobule. Um, so these intercalated ducts are, and we see slightly, slightly larger ones there. Um, they have got a simple cuboidal epithelium, um, and we may see some tiny myoepithelial cells, so contractile cells around these, and we'll see myoepithelial cells also around the secretory acinar cells. So these are contractile cells that can squeeze the secretions into the duct and squeeze them along the duct. Um, and look, we see plenty of these intercalated ducts here. Now, if you imagine that this duct goes along and then drains into a larger duct, as we get into the larger ducts, we can see a bit of that branching pattern there, can't we, because of the way the, the way that has been sectioned, the angle of section, we can see some ducts coming together, or changing angle at least. But the, as these become larger ducts, the epithelial cells get a little bit taller. So if we find some taller cells, ah, oh, look, see that's, you agree? Those cells are taller, right, um, than those cells over there. So now we're looking at a striated duct. So those, this is also an intralobular duct because we're still inside the lobule. But this is a striated duct and I don't know how well we can make out here but the, the basal membrane of these epithelial cells is highly folded. Um, these cells are actually actively uh, moving ions about to create an isotonic or to manage the solution, the fluid that's inside the duct to make it isotonic, to give it the right the right level of various salts and fluid. Um, and we can see some little tiny blood vessels, I think, running around it, which makes sense. That's what you'd normally see, All right? So that folding of the basal cell membrane is to increase surface area. Right, now, let's, um, let's just jump back to the 200 times magnification. Um, and hopefully now you can see that within the lobule um, we've got those secretory acinar units, um, those intercalated ducts, 
um, and straight ducts. And now if we, those, those, those ducts are going to take the saliva out of the lobule into the connective tissue between the lobules, so they will become interlobular ducts, ducts between the lobules. I think this is another reason why we um, classically taught saliva gland histology, because you, you get to use all these terms, intralobular, interlobular, and that sort of thing. So let's have a look around. We can see, look, we can see some lovely shapes of the intralobular ducts, but um, there we go. So in the connective tissue there, we're seeing some blood vessels, and we're seeing some interlobular ducts. So these ducts are bigger. If I just slide back down to the lobule, we can compare the size of those ducts, right? So intralobular ducts, interlobular ducts, much bigger because, of course, lots of ducts have drained into this larger duct. If I jump back up to the higher power, um, These cells, mm, they're not too tall, are they? They're not really columnar. In fact, these look pretty cuboidal. See, there's the difference. There's, um, there's a blood vessel. We've got a very thin endothelial cells lining the blood vessel, and we've got blood on the inside. Whereas there's our secretory glandular tissue. All looks quite different. There's our connective tissue, so lots of collagen fibrils and other bits and bobs being maintained by fibroblasts. And then in here, there's our inter lobular duct, which is much larger. And like I say, typically the cells get a little bit taller. And we're getting kind of like a pseudo-stratified epithelium there. It looks like it's got multiple layers, right? Of course, these interlobular ducts will then drain into larger and larger interlobular ducts. Um, so that's, that's why we're seeing an epithelium here. This epithelium is lining a system of tubes that are ducting onto an external surface. So essentially they're a continuation of the external surface. But anyway, these interlobular ducts will then drain into larger and larger ducts. And the parotid gland is a bit special because each parotid gland has a singular parotid duct or Stenson duct, which carries that saliva into the oral cavity on the inside there. Um, so if you can imagine that branching pattern, we've done well. Let me just, if I have a little look around, can I see? No, this looks very, it does look very serious. Uh, the extra staining we get on the edge there is a bit of an edge effect of the stain collecting there because of uh, surface tension usually. Um, what I'm looking for is, uh, oh, there's another interlobular duct. What I'm looking for is uh, a collection of mucus secreting cells, just to show you the difference. I, unusually, I've only got a parotid gland. I haven't got any other gland, any other salivary gland histology sections that I could find in my boxes to show you. Okay, so that is the histology of a salivary gland. A salivary gland is a good example of an exocrine gland with ducts lined with epithelium that branch and we see that glandular tissue so we get used to seeing what a glandular tissue looks like. Collections of secretory cells arranged around a duct and draining, they secrete into that duct and then that duct carries those secretions into ever larger ducts and then onto an external surface, that's what exocrine means. And if you can imagine that layout and you can link it to this single section through a salivary gland, that will stand you in good stead when you're imagining looking at the tissues and the structures of other glands within the body. All right, cool. See you next week.